My comments today are called Beautiful Work. I've been in education 44 years, and my passion for 44 years has been that I think we vastly underestimate the capacity of kids to do beautiful work. And I'm talking about all kids. When I talk about beautiful work and project-based learning, I'm not a fan of project-based learning because it's the new thing or it's the current thing. I'm a fan of project-based learning because that's what life is. When our students leave our schools and enter life, they will no longer be judged by standardized tests. They'll be judged for the rest of their lives by two things, the quality of person they are and the quality of work that they do. It doesn't matter what choices they make, whether they're a surgeon or a plumber or raising a family, the quality of who they are as human beings and the quality of work that they do is what will matter for the rest of their life. And that's what should matter in schools. I work with an organization now, EL Education, that's a good friend of PBL Works. And we are trying to change the national conversation about what student achievement means. Right now, our nation has a one-dimensional view of student achievement. Student achievement means test scores in two subjects on a basic level. So when you read in your newspaper, this is a high achieving school, what does that mean? It means one thing, it means their test scores in math and literacy are good, that's all. And we would say that three dimensional student achievement means that kids are doing great academic work and they're building their character and they're doing high quality work, that there's craftsmanship in what they do. And you can't have craftsmanship without projects to work on. This is doing what kids will, what will prepare kids for their real lives. So, I've been in this a long time. I started as a project-based learning teacher in the early 70s. And project-based learning was really big in the country in the 70s and 80s. And then in the 90s, it almost went away because No Child Left Behind and state standards and state testing and high pressure, pretty soon the elements of project-based learning started to disappear. I am so pleased that Buck Foundation, now PBL Works, in the end of the 90s, called me up and said, we are going to commit our foundation to one thing in education, project-based learning. So I flew out here to California, I met with John Larmer and John Mergendaler and John Thomas and Tom Markham and worked on these early books about project-based learning 20 years ago. And at that time, it was just a few people as part of this organization, and it was not a national movement or an international movement. And look at it now. Look at this group now. It's an amazing thing. Great credit to Bob and Brandon and Dinah and the whole team here at PBL Works, but also to you. You are the ambassadors of this movement. And it's people from all over the world here, more than a thousand people. This is taking off in a way that I don't think it can be stopped. Because it's what parents want, right? It's the kind of education we all want for our kids. So when I talk about beautiful work, I'm not just talking about beautiful artistic work. I'm talking about beautiful mathematic work, beautiful scientific work, beautiful work in every dimension. And I'm talking about beautiful acts of social justice, acts of equity, acts of compassion and kindness. And I've spent the last 44 years collecting models of beautiful student projects. It's not my wife's favorite thing. My entire basement is plastic bins of student work. <laughs> but about 10 years ago, I started working to scan all of that work. And with my colleagues at Harvard and my colleagues at EL Education, we built a free website where hundreds and hundreds of projects are up as models. I'm shamelessly advertising that with you today for two reasons. One is, I want to tell you that everything you see on screen is free and open source on that website, along with hundreds and hundreds of other models that I hope you will use and share 
They've been donated by teachers and school leaders and district leaders all over the world so that you can share them. And also, I'm shamelessly promoting this because I want you to submit your project work to us. I can't guarantee that every project will be inducted. We have a curation team at Harvard that looks at every piece and sees if it's adding something new and if the quality is what we're looking for right now. But you won't get it accepted if you don't submit. So give it a shot. Submit the best works of any kind in any discipline pre-K to 12 from your school. And we would love to get more submissions from you. Everything you submit that gets inducted will be shared with the world. So we are trying to share what models of excellence can mean to kids, that you can go out in the world and do this. This morning, I'm going to share with you some stories about my particular passion for project-based learning, why I've been a project-based person my entire life. I do want to acknowledge, this is our website, Models of Excellence. I do want to acknowledge that my perspective is limited by my identity. Right? I'm an old white guy from New England. Um, my perspective is going to be white, it's going to be male, it's going to be New England-y. Um, I mean, I root for Boston teams, right? Like, you can't trust me on everything. I, I even root for the Patriots, which is like, like, you can't get less ethical than that. So I know you can't trust that I'll understand your perspective on everything. But as an old white guy, I hope that I'll have some examples and stories and values that will resonate with you from your place in the world, from your work, from your perspective. And I'm here all day and really happy to engage with you in that. Um, before I dive into those stories, I want to name one new exhibit we have in the Modern Excellence Collection. Last year, we built an exhibit around how do you help your school and your district and your students document the beautiful projects you do really well. Because a lot of times you guys do amazing projects, but then they disappear. All we have is the final product. We don't have the learning in the process along the way. So we have a new toolkit online of how to document your work well and how to have students in the lead on that documentation. I hope that's a useful resource. Like everything else we have, it's totally open and free. All right, let me get into stories. The nearest city to where I personally live is Springfield, Massachusetts. So Springfield, Massachusetts is a very typical northeastern city. Used to have a lot of industry, it's all gone. Right now, high poverty, high unemployment, it's a pretty tough place. There's six high schools in Springfield, Massachusetts. Five of those high schools graduate 62% of their kids. So you got to be thinking about what happens to the other 38%. There's one high school there that's graduating 98% of its kids on time. And for 10 consecutive years, 100% of graduates have gotten into college. This is a high school that I was fortunate to help open. But I want to name right now, it is a regular district high school with no selective admission. It's not a charter. It's not a magnet. It doesn't have anything special. You have to do a lottery to get in, but anyone in the city can get in. It's primarily low-income students of color, and every single graduate has gotten into college since the school opened. So what's the difference here? Why is this school succeeding with the same kids as the other five schools are not? It's not just projects, like, right? It's the culture of the school, too. There are daily crew meetings, which you would call, we call it crew in EL, you might, would call it advisory meetings. Every day, every kid sits down with her crew of a dozen kids and talks about her life and her challenges and her academic work in that same family for four consecutive years of high school. That's a big part of it. The relationships in the school are super deep. Every kid is known, every staff is known. There's an incredible faculty culture. But it is also the projects because the work that kids do in this school has meaning. And I will only tell you one example of that this morning. But these students, ninth grade science students, were trained by city engineers to do energy audits of buildings. They tested for insulation, boilers, window treatments, uh, elect electrical functions of all the appliances in the building. 
And those kids prepared a report for the city of every city school and where it was losing energy and money. And they asked the city of Springfield to invest $156,000 to retrofit their schools to make them more energy efficient. And they promised the city in their report that the city would make back every penny it invested within five years, because they did a cost-benefit analysis of the retrofits. And they priced out all the building renovations. So, they did this in public. So the mayor had to respond, because they did it in a public <laughs> press conference. So the mayor went back to his staff. This same mayor that's there today, Dominic Sarno, went back to his staff and said, what do I do? I can't not respond here. I'm, I'm like in a corner right now. And they said, Mr. Sarno, Mr. Mayor, you should invest $156,000 to retrofit these schools. We train these kids. They're right. Like, this is a great report. We believe that their report is correct. So the mayor went on television and he said, we're going to invest $156,000 to retrofit our city schools to make them more energy efficient because these students in our public school told us that within five years we'll make all of our money back, we'll save money for the city, and we'll help save the environment. Then he went to the school and said, you kids better be right. <laughs> well, within two years, the city had saved $160,000 in energy expenses. So by then they were making money. The mayor came back to the school and he said, we just set aside a quarter of a million dollars for you to be the energy orders for the rest of the buildings in our city. When he left, the kid said, Mr. Berger, this is kind of like slave labor, isn't it? <laughs> and we said, well, yeah, yes, it is. However, you're all going to college. You could come back here and change the world with your skills. Like, you're on television now as ninth graders, that's pretty good. Now I want to back up and get even more personal. This is why project-based learning really means something to me. I live in a small rural town in New England. When I moved to this town, it was fewer than 700 people. It was a working class town up in the hills. I taught every kid in this town. Everyone in my town under the age of 50 is my former student, right? <laughs> That's how small this world is. So why does that matter to me? Because my nurse is my former student. Because my plumber is my former student. Because the lifeguards at our town lake are my former students. Because the entire volunteer fire department are my former students. My life is in the hands of my former students. If you think about that, <laughs> what are the things you want your students to have? It's not just good test scores in third grade. So, I will tell you, my wife had a serious accident. I was not home. I was building a playhouse for my grandkids in another town. I was on the roof of the playhouse, and my daughter came out, handed me the phone, she said, it's the police. Well, every first responder at my home to save my wife's life were my former students. So if you think, if someone you love were in trouble and the first responders showed up and they were all your former students, who would you want them to be? What values, what ethic would you want them to have? And then you realize, why does character and high quality work mean so much to me? Because my entire life depends on that. Now you might not live in a small town, but it's the same for you. Because every first responder, every firefighter, every nurse, every doctor you see is somebody's former student. And we should be working on high quality work and high quality character all day long, because that's where our lives are in their hands, right? This is why project-based learning means something to me. Not because it's the current thing, not because it's fashionable, but because this is what life is. It's about doing projects and doing things well. So, my town only has seven buildings. It's got the church in the middle of the hill. It's got the post office, which was Mary Dillman's home. In fact, you've got to walk into Mary Dillman's home to get your mail. And I taught Mary Dillman's kids, and I taught Mary Dillman's grandkids. It's got the town hall. It's got the volunteer fire shed, where the volunteer fire department are my former students. And it's got the library that has no plumbing, a one room that's open two days a week. And it's got one business, the Shootsbury Athletic Club. 
There's no elliptical trainers or treadmills in this building. It's a bar in the middle of the woods. <laughs> and if you go in and get a beer, the bartender is going to be my former student. I'll tell you. Like, <laughs> that's the life I live. And they'll do a really good job. And then there's the school. So one of the great things about living in a town with no government, I mean, our government is people coming into the school gym and arguing in a town meeting. Like, that's the whole government. <laughs> is that in a town with no government, my students basically ran the town. So uh, they did demographic studies, they did voter work, they did, like, the kids, the elementary kids basically did all the work that, that people do in cities that are hired to do. Let me just give you one example. When the state of Massachusetts asks each town to do an amphibian census for their town, meaning what amphibians live in your town, other cities and towns hired a herpetologist or a naturalist to do that, and we sent out kids, third and fourth graders, we trained them how to identify amphibians, and those kids went out and collected and measured and weighed and photographed amphibians throughout the town, during school, after school, every weekend. When those kids sent in their report to the state, the state wrote back and said, congratulations, third and fourth grade herpetologists, you sent us more data than any town or city in the state of Massachusetts. <laughs> it wasn't a fair fight, you know. Everyone else had one person, we had 38 third and fourth graders. But they said, but you did make a couple of mistakes because there's two amphibians that you identified that actually aren't native to your town, and the kids were incensed. So we had to teach them how to send a polite rebuttal Thank you, thank you, State of Massachusetts, for acknowledging our research, but we politely disagree with your critique of our findings. We believe we've correctly identified those two species, and we want to meet with you in person. So the state was so amused that they actually sent a herpetologist across the state, couldn't find our town. This is before GPS. He had to call from another town. We directed him to the school. The kids brought him into the woods, and, of course, the kids were right. They had correctly identified these species, and after he left, they said, you know, Mr. Berger, we're, we're not just practicing to be scientists, we kind of are scientists now. And I said, absolutely so. And some of those kids are scientists today, since I know what every one of my frickin' students did in the world, <laughs> right? They also were involved in a service project. Our favorite amphibian is the local spotted salamander, and these guys migrate across the roads, and they tend to get run over by pickup trucks. So the kids were part of the world's first salamander tunnels where the salamanders get directed underground so they won't get run over. And this sign is a mile from my house. <laughs> it was produced by the state DPW, but it was designed and drawn by a third grade girl. They also then created a field guide to the local amphibia. And that was way back in the early 80s. So I brought that field guide to an EL school at King Middle School, and they decided, well, why don't we create a field guide to Casco Bay, Maine? And this school is a public middle school where a third of the kids are refugees. So a third of the kids come from East Africa, Somalia, Sudan. Every kid in that school, no matter what her level of English was, was a part of this project. They all created pages for this field guide. And imagine being a seventh grader and bringing your parents or your foster family into the National Park Service or a tourist shop and saying, that's our field guide. The one you're buying that raises money for the bay, we created that. This is my page. That jellyfish, I did that page. Like, this is my work that's contributing to a better world. And none of those kids were allowed to go online and look at a jellyfish. They had to go put on wetsuits, which we borrowed, and underwater cameras, which they borrowed, and photograph these things underwater because that's what scientist life is like. Like, that's what our real project-based world is. Then I brought that field guide to preschools, and they created field guides to the parks next to their house. And I brought it to my friends who were starting High Tech High, and they started a series of high school level field guides. You might see the forward here is by Jane Goodall. They did print runs of 10,000 copies telling, selling this book for $25 each. And you can't distinguish this book from adult level field guide. And yet entirely done, laid out, photographed, researched, done by students, by high school students. Because high school kids could do anything we can do in that way. I want to talk about one project that second graders in one of our schools did. They said, we want to create a field guide, but we don't know how to get it out to the world. So they decided field guides in paper are kind of the past. 
let's do an ebook field guide. That way it could be available to the world for free. So they did a Snakes of the World ebook field guide. So every page in this book, you can see Nashari Davis's page, is done by a student. And you think, oh my God, look at the quality of drawings that these kids did. And every kid's drawing is gorgeous like this. But here's what's amazing, because it's an ebook, and you can download this onto your iPad or get it on their website, it's called Slithering Snake Stories. And on every page, if you click on the page, you hear the student reading her work aloud. And you also hear sound effects that they layered as a separate audio track. And you also hear music that sets the mood. And the music is music played by the kids and partly composed by the kids. And the kids did all the software work to actually create this guide. So I'm going to click onto a page and you'll hear one of the students reading aloud his day in the life. For Lance Viper in the Amazon River by Gavin Briggs. One June morning, the sun rises over the Amazon River. The sound of cicadas and the loud honking of macaws and parakeets consume the air. A warm breeze sweeps into the mangrove forest. Male bullfrogs and red-eyed tree frogs slowly begin to stop croaking. Howler monkeys start to call in a Mark My Territory choir. The winding vines overflow the canopy. Spider monkeys swing from vine to vine. A young 10-inch long fertilance viper wiggles out of his mother's belly and streaks out of her way. He slitters off into the canopy. His diamond patterned scales shine in the sunlight as he slithers off in search of a suitable place to live. After a while, he curls up for a good nap. When he wakes, he is hungry, so he slithers off. He creeps closer and closer to a red-eyed tree frog. Bang! Within a second, he strikes. His fangs pierce the frog's skin as he slowly inches his mouth up the frog's slimy body. Then he rests on a nearby branch to digest. He wakes up suddenly as a hairy eagle comes swooping down. Fertilance freezes. Bam! He strikes. As the venom pours into the eagle's body, destroying its veins and arteries, the bird gets skinnier and skinnier. It falls out of the tree and lands with a thump. After a while, Fertilance finds a hole in a tree near the Amazon River and checks if there's anybody inside. It's empty, so he slithers into the hole and gets himself cozy. Soon he will need to shed. For now, he curls up and sleeps motionless with his eyes wide open. Okay, Gavin is now in middle school. Gavin is in middle school now. He's a little embarrassed by that piece. But when my wife listened to these, she said, my wife's a nurse, not an educator. She said, how old are these kids? I said, they're seven. She's like, school's really different today. <laughs> so I, I can't even do that stuff now. So um, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, why project-based learning is the right thing for all kids. So I want to tell you the story of Jamie, who lived right next to the school where I taught forever, for 28 years, um, and the story of a project she created. So Jamie lived in a very low-income household, single mom household, but she was the most sought-after babysitter in my whole town because she was so capable in every possible way. And she bought this horse. Foxy with her own babysitting money. Uh, we were studying architecture, and we did a project where kids were doing a cross-sectional cave home design. So it's a cave home for people to live underground. This is Jamie's project. 
But I want to tell you, as capable as Jamie was, she also had profound learning challenges. So she had a major special education plan. And when she came to me as a fifth grader, I had her for fifth and sixth grade, she said, Mr. Berger, I know the kind of projects you do because you had my older brother. And I can't do projects like that because my brain is broken. It just doesn't work right. I said, Jamie, you'll be able to do any quality project just like your brother did because it's all about the support. Like, we, we'll do this together. And she started crying. She said, you don't know how hard this stuff is for me. Well, the second day of school when Jamie was a fifth grader, we went, oh, I should say, Jamie had an advantage here. She went to a project-based learning school. So let's look at kindergarten. This is a kindergartner's view of her life in our school. I make projects, I like to swim, and I go to sleep. <laughs> Look at her picture and I make projects. Do you see her hands? Do you see her smile? Do you see how capable and empowered she is there? Like, she wouldn't say, I make worksheets, right? <laughs> it's just not the same thing. She is a powerful person. And so when Jamie was in first grade, you can see Jamie on the left when she published her first book. Like, this is a project-based school. Even if she has learning challenges, she's going to do beautiful work right away in kindergarten and first grade. But in fifth and sixth grade, we were studying this architecture in cave homes. So we started out by going cave exploring on the second day of school. And it was to build the outward bound teamwork of our group. And Jamie was terrific and courageous at being underground. But when she did her first draft of her cave design, she didn't understand figure ground. She didn't understand cross section. So it was really challenged for her. And when she finished it, she cried. She said, Mr. Berger, I, I, I just don't understand it. And I don't want you to pin it up for critique because I'm ashamed of it. And I said, Jamie, you don't have to pin it up for critique, but you have to get critique from someone. So she went to her friend, Nicole, who re-explained cross-section to her. And her second draft actually is cross-sectional. Like, this one started to work. She said, I like this one better. We can pin it up for critique. And so we did. And one piece of critique she got from the kid who was considered the cutest boy in the class <laughs> was that he really liked those overlapping rocks. So her third draft was all overlapping rocks. <laughs> But then she got critiqued that it didn't have enough space, so she took the overlapping rocks from this draft and the space from her second draft and created a fourth draft now with overlapping rocks and more space. And then she said, but Mr. Berger, my handwriting isn't so good. Could you teach me calligraphy really fast? And I said, well, no, but you can use our light table to trace. And so she came before school for a week and traced. And after a week of tracing, this was her freehand calligraphy. So when you look at her final draft lettering, it's beautiful, too, because beautiful work is about hard work. It's not about natural talent. Like, she put her mind to it and created a beautiful piece of work that she was proud to do. And I just want to tell you, since I know every, every one of my students where they are, I went to Jamie's college graduation party. She went to high school with a very heavy ed plan, let me say. But she went to the Stockbridge School of Agriculture at the University of Massachusetts. I went to her college graduation party. She walked up to me with two solo cups of beer. She handed one to me, and she said, can you believe I got a college diploma? I said, I, of course I can believe it. I always believed in you. And she said, I have the same freaking learning dis disabilities as I had in first grade. I still reverse letters. I still reverse numbers. But look at me. I'm a college graduate. I said, how have you done it? She said, strategies and hard work. Like, that's what life's about. So she is now manager of a horse farm. And two weeks ago, there she is with her daughter. I went to her daughter's graduation party from high school. Jamie runs a horse farm, and she works with adults with disabilities. And I also want to mention that I taught Jamie's younger brother, the little guy with blonde hair, who came to me as a sixth grader without reading, full reading skills. He was even more learning challenged. And yet, that was the year that we tested every home in town for radon, and he was a part of this major project to create a radon study for the entire town. A study that was so in demand that kids had to turn themselves into like a nonprofit business sending out copies of this report across the state. 
and across the country. And even this fall, 20 years later, I got a report, a, a request from the town board of health, we need that re radon report. Because it's the only report for our town and the only one in the state. So, here he is today, Mike, as an adult, He's a stay-at-home dad with three kids, and he has a very successful motorcycle repair business in his garage. So, there are the three kids from that family. They, I couldn't be more proud of kids. They had learning challenges, but they are wonderful human beings who have the highest standards for the work they do. And that's what project-based work can give us all, is the skills we need for a real life. I'm gonna close with a one-minute video. You remember those kids who studied snakes? Well, they learned that snakes are oppressed in the world. And in a world of equity and justice, everything deserves equity and justice, even snakes. <laughs> so, I mean, they pointed out that in every religion and every fable, snakes are the bad guys. So they decided they had to stand up for snakes. So they created a music video about why we should stand up for snakes. They took the song Born This Way by Lady Gaga <laughs> and they rewrote it as Snakes Are Born This Way. And because this school believes in high quality PBL, it's a high quality music video. And in fact, it's gone viral and it has like 50,000 views. So to close, here is uh, Snakes Are Born This Way. And you'll see these kids actually are seven years old. It doesn't matter if you're scared of them or not. Just open up your heart because snakes were just born this way. Thank you, Ron.